I'm of course happy to be here, but I can't replace uh, Terry. Uh, maybe I'm gonna be like a chap GPT and be a kind of robot pre pretending to be Terry guys in some ways. That uh, I have her notes here. Uh, the only times I will improvise would be uh, if I have to say something about Ted Jones, uh, who uh, I knew in, met at first in the 70s uh, I in Paris, and was, he was instrumental actually for me going to uh, the United States, and then when I became a professor, every year I had to invite him to New York, and he goes to other universities. But let's go with Terry's notes first. Now, how, what do I do? to change slides. Ah, bravo. Okay. Down and up. This is number one, this is number two. Bravo. Still good? Yeah. So I'm going to read notes, and then if I have to comment, I, w I, I, will, I will do. Uh, so the first introduction, I had first comment. I met Terry in Egypt, and it was surrealism uh, the Egyptian surrealism when we first met. And the reason w why I was there was to talk about African-American surrealist, and she was talking about Mexican surrealist. And wha what was interesting about it is uh, we found how s surrealism and decolonization, decolonizing struggles actually uh, companions. There are some places where they diverge, they go in different directions, but most of the time they are talking uh, against Western rationality together, uh, and they are trying to liberate other spaces. They, they, uh, this is what we found, and then she was talking about Mexico, and I'm talking about Africa, and then she's a specialist of Breton, and all my time I'm challenging not just me, this kind of school I was trained in challenged Breton. They uh, uh, call it Eurocentric uh, surrealism. Uh, it's not what uh, Cesar is doing. It's not what black surrealists are doing because they are doing decolonization. But actually, they are doing the same struggle with differences here and there. So th this is uh, important. Uh, and then Terry is here introducing uh, Ted Jones born in Illinois, uh, riverboat work, a son of ri riverboat workers, uh, incredibly prolific writer, collage artist, uh, musician. And uh, let me add, uh, comment on this a little bit. 1973, I'm a young African in Paris. And sex many of you may know about a bookstore called Shakespeare and Company at uh, Notre Dame in Paris. There is a famous bookstore where uh, American in general, American writers, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, uh, but also Langston Hughes, and the bookstore, the patron, now run by, but the patron was a woman called Gertrude Stein, and she wrote this book, The Lost Generation. She's talking about all these American writers who came to Paris as a lost generation. Now, Ted Jones is the continuation of that. And uh, he was uh, reading a, a po his poetry at Shakespeare and Company one night, and I just went there by chance because I was following. I wrote about this in my book, We Won't Budge. I'm following she with these girls who go to Paris as nannies, and you, know, you want to pick up a woman, so I go with them to a poetry reading. This is how I met Ted Jones, literally. And the, Ted Jones, to make ma matters complicated, this is what's great about surrealism. After he read his poems, uh, I was, I had a dashiki on coming from Mali, some kind of bohlan. Ted Jones pointed me, he said, that guy there, he understood everything I was talking about. And everybody turned around and they looked at me. I, he didn't speak English, really. <laughs> at that time, I had high school Bamako English. I'd, so I couldn't understand jazz poetry, and Ted Jones is a jazz poet uh, in a bebop, uh, Greenwich Village, uh, that 
Bebop generation with Allen Ginsberg, and so that's where Ted Jones is coming from. So I start following Ted Jones forever, <laughs> you know, in Paris, until he literally sat me down one day and told me, say, young man, I know what you're trying to do, but you don't have my talent. You can't be me. So I'll advise you <laughs> to leave Paris. And this is all look like fantasy. It's, it's in my book, We Won't Budge. But he gave me addresses. Uh, and the address is uh, Kwame Toure, Sonia Sanchez, Angela Davis, that I just finished making a film on. This is all done like that. And then I went to the United States and ended up creating a black studies at a place that was against black studies. Black studies started in 1969. NYU black studies was started in 1992. That's how many years after the beginning of black studies. And the person they hired to create it was me. So I went to NYU to create black studies. And uh, bring, since then, I bring Ted Jones back. I was bringing back to Santa Barbara when I was a professor. And then I moved to UPenn. And I bring Ted Jones back. So that's, Ted Jones basically survives by going. He will come to Europe at certain season of the year and then uh, read poems in different places. And then he will go to America to make some more money. And then he will go to Africa, had a house in Timbuktu, had a house in different places of the world. So he's met poets and writers and uh, musicians everywhere. This is Ted Jones. Uh, uh, and I'll come more with this. Uh, so. As renowned in one of uh, uh, his memoirs, he became acquainted with surrealism very early on. Uh, conduit between multiple modernist movements in the United States and throughout the world, most specifically post-war surrealism and the Beat Generation and the Black Art Movement. So this is really movements that would have been antagonistic, the beat generation. I think the other, only other person who connected them would be L the guy who used to be called Leroy Jones and who become Amiri Baraka. So he was both in Greenwich Village, but he was also a black art uh, movement poet uh, in a way. And then uh, Ted Jones is this guy, is that generation also, and uh, was surrealist, but also black art movement and beat generation poet and a, a jazz musician. Uh, Self-exiled uh, to Mali and to Paris among many other places. Uh, let me keep doing this. Uh, and as Jones expanded his travels into and throughout Africa, spending extensive time among other places in Timbuktu, he questioned the role of African art within modernism through a recentering of contemporary African culture in politics. And this is really good. I don't know how to go uh, through it, but uh, Terry and I, we are curating now a show in Glasgow at the Hunterian Museum. Because of these questions of restitution, they asked us to uh, they have a lot of African masks and sculptures. They say, what would we do with this today? And Ted Jones really opened the door for us to relate this mask to contemporary African artists. So, the, but Ted, Terry knows how to go about this uh, in, in a more intelligent manner than myself, so I just keep it to the reading. Look here specifically uh, to West Africa and Berlin from the 1980s to the, er, uh, to the early 2000s. In the 80s, he spent time in Berlin uh, through an artist residency funded through the DAD, D-A-A-D program. So let me see uh, if I can. This is where we miss you, Terry. Uh, I'm trying to be you. Okay, I stop. 
<laughs> with the monk area here, yeah, but and read more. In 1963, a year and a half after the construction of the Berlin Wall, the Ford Foundation created a three-year program aimed at expanding and strengthening the cultural and educational resources of Berlin. This is, I mean, those of you who know Hakave uh, in, in Berlin, built uh, by John Kennedy, and I think I, I mentioned this a little bit uh, yesterday when I was talking about the origin of Voice of America and the black American traveling around the world. As America's way of saying, look, we're not racist. We are one country. We are one nation, and so on. Uh, I, I think Berlin was an interesting place in that, in a sense that you have the wall, and Ted Jones is working there. Uh, Terry talks about this in very uh, fascinating manner, because the wall is there, but Ted Jones will write his poems and throw them across the wall, because he thought that language, the, you know, you can stop people, this is what's happening in, uh, in the US now, you can stop people from crossing, but you can't stop ideas from crossing frontiers. And that fluidity through walls was very important to both uh, Ted Jones and but also to Terry, Terry here. Uh, he, curi he created a, a, journal, a surrealist journal called this and that. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, now, before we come to long distance, I think. Well, let me read about it then, because I'm, I'm not that familiar with her PowerPoint. Uh, he created a surrealist journal called This and I, and the This is uh, writ uh, written like a uh, D-I-E-S, like dies in English, and, and das is D-A-S, thinking through the legacies of uh, World War II and the realities of the Cold War in, in those years. This book is based on imaginative proposals of connection, attempt to move outside of boundaries uh, and borders. What he creates while in Berlin is an attempt to link the world not promote U.S. cultural or political policy, and uh, underscoring instead connection uh, between artists. This is more or less what I was trying to say, uh, because the U.S. sent you to celebrate U.S. culture, basically. Uh, but he was trying to connect the world uh, uh, in Berlin. For example, his fellow writer in residence, Robert Creeley, recounts a night at a Berlin art gallery where Ted Jones was having a finissage, and finissage is a, yeah, vernissage, finissage, so in case you don't understand my, my English, uh, of his uh, surrealist and historical artifact, including a great film of himself in Timbuktu, which uh, the Germans loved. Uh, this and that, the single issue journal Jones uh, described it as collaged out of his inner necessity to service through amalgamation those who have been victims of being neglected. This is how Ted Jones described his, uh, this book. Drawing, drawings, maps, poems, cutouts from newspapers, and Jones' handwritten and typed annotation an older surrealist essay. Two elements uh, central to his practice as it is transmitted through spaces of West Africa and Central uh, Europe. And the two uh, uh, concepts for Ted Jones that are surrealist, uh, that those of you who are surrealist will know something about this, but actually I didn't know this part. Uh, he said the two concepts are drifting and cutting, or what he calls the snip snap. Uh, drifting is a term that Andre Breton uh, uses when he talks about surrealist games, especially the exquisite corpse. Uh, so I think I can go to, 
Yeah, that's the ex uh, Ted Jones ex exquisite corpse. Long distance exquisite corpse, 1976, 2005. Now, I, I will stop here for another anecdote. Uh, in 2017 or maybe, no, I don't, maybe 15 at most, uh, I went to see uh, David Hammonds. And David Hammonds took out a DVD and gave me a DVD. He said, have you seen this? I uh, said no, so I took it home and I gave it to Terry and Terry looked at it and Terry says to me, do you know what you got here? I said, oh, David Hammond gave it to me and you know, he's always trying to impress me. Terry said, no, this has the whole history of uh, the, uh, this, this, uh, surrealists that are now Europeans, surrealists from all over the world because he was doing uh, the, the, the ex exquisite corpse, 1976 to 2005, everywhere he went. He, he goes to either book, uh, book, uh, bookshop owner or writer or poet, uh, he will have them draw something. That's what the exquisite corpse I is about. So, I, so Terry said, hey, this is very, very important. Did you realize that? I said, okay. And then I went to David Hammond. I said, David, do you know what you gave me? It's very important. He said, well, so let me give you uh, David's uh, uh, version of this. I had uh, one of those years, Ted Jones uh, come to uh, NYU to give a talk. And David Hammond actually, according to him, had always been dreaming of becoming somebody as free as Ted Jones his whole life. So, we here we are admiring David Hammond as you know unusual, very different, a genius, but he wanted to be like Ted Jones. So Ted Jones asked David, Can I, I do an exquisite corpse? Can you draw something for me? And David said to him, Yes, we can do it on condition that I film it. So they went to Robin Kelly's house and they filmed uh, Ted Jones, as he was unfolding this, he was unfolding this, and then uh, uh, David Hammond had a DVD, and he just gave it to me like that. And then, and so I said, it's very important. You know, you sure you want to give it to me? He said, oh, sure. Where, where is Ted Jones now? So, well, he passed. And uh, does he have a family? I said, well, he, yeah, Laura uh, Corsigliani is his wife, his widow. Uh, he said, why don't you do something and get the money and send it to her? So he gave us about $50,000, 30 guys, myself, and my students, to master the uh, exquisite corpse, basically, to master it. And he said, but when you show it, don't show it in any place where people know it's happening. So the first time we did it was in Dakar, but not in Dakar, in a small village where I usually go on vacation. Believe it or not, the word got out because people like Salah Hassan, other art historians say, you know what Mancha is showing at his place? Ted Jones, ex no, David Hammond's exquisite corpse because they know David Hammond now. <laughs> so, so basically we show it like that and ended up at, uh, at Ted, uh, Marvin. Tate Marvin. Uh, at, at MoMA just bought, uh, maybe about a month ago, MoMA just and because David Hammond's name is on it now. But Ted Jones is really, uh, they have a show, he's in a surrealist group now in, uh, in Paris. Uh, they're doing shows on him everywhere now. Uh, and he has been that special person to us, but it's really uh, with the exquisite, uh, with David Hammond's name tied to his name that suddenly everybody wants to know who's this guy. Uh, so that, that, that is the digression that I, uh, I would make. And so let me uh, go on. John began um, another drawing project, Long Distance. And the one I've been talking about is called Long Distance. It's this one. Okay. As he traveled the world, he asked artists and writers, including European surrealists, Nigerian and South African writers, US beat 
poets and jazz musicians and Mexicans, painters and intellectuals among many others to add a drawing to the piece. He ingeniously created an accordion style. Oh, this is another digression I, I, I have to tell you, I'm sorry. So as they were filming, he, he has one of these envelopes uh, par avion where you put the exquisite corpse in it. And it was really old and disabused, but Ted John was keeping it. And then uh, my wife then, in those days, a lawyer, she's a lawyer, she said, well, what? She, she feels sorry for us because she's a writer and she calls us people with no visible means of support. That's what <laughs> we are, no visible. So, so she wanted to help. She said to Ted John, she said, get you a nice envelope, I get you a bag and so on. And Ted John said, Mantis wife, if so you did it, you, you will hear that. He said, Mantis wife said, I said, no, 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 you will spoil it. Don't touch it. Just leave it like this. So the envelope is incredible. So when you see Ted John unfolding the whole exquisite corpse, it's a movie in itself. Because he will stop and he say, this is Joyce Mansour. Or this, this is uh, Malangatana. He give you names that he never heard of, uh, but who were part, parts of this movement? Uh, so, so when Terry said he created an accordion, that it made me think of that uh, uh, style, that uh, matrix computer paper that Jones had found discarded on the street. By the time the piece was finished, nearly 30 years later, it included drawing by 132 artists, as Jones recounted in an interview. Long distance, cor uh, uh, long distance exquisite corpse is a continuous idea of a collective or collaborative authorship in which an ongoing composite image is producing its own meaning indetermined by any single participant. This is actually a nice sentence in reminding me of uh, Gleason, so I keep going. Because I'm learning this as I go. <laughs> you know, she sent me something to read to you, so but I, I like this, okay. Uh, 36 feet long. This innovation of Jones here in the exquisite corpse process is the varying of distances between his participants who at time knew each other and watched each other at, and drawing on alternatives were, or alternatively were separated by thousands of miles and connected only by Jones himself. The long long, long line of the exquisite corpse is mirrors in John's imaginative musing in this and that. So we're talking about this and that. He envisioned the Wuppertal suspension railway opened in 1901 as expanding across borders and down into Africa. Now, Wuppertal, I do not know. Some of you may know, uh, be familiar with this. Uh, and, and quote here, spread all over Europe and across to Morocco, then down the western coast of Africa, bringing porous borders and new interconnections. At Senegal, it should turn uh, inland toward Mali and upward along the Niger River to Timbuktu. Upon arriving at Timbuktu, the passengers will instantly disembark mount camels or donkeys and proceed to the world's most marvelous museum of contemporary action. New determination of what is uh, possible in the world. Wuppertal also site of one of the first Nazi concentration camps, much of city later destroyed by bombing of allies forces. Okay, so she want me to show something here between uh, 33 minute 20. I think this is the time for the film, I think. Uh, if we can check that. Uh, minute 33, 20. I 
think Terry will really appreciate your patience because thank you very much. I forgot to say that for staying, and she's not here. Uh, oh, I've seen plenty. 33. All of it? Uh, no, no, no. If you begin at the, yeah, you begin it at 33.20 seconds. Yeah, I think maybe somewhere. How many minutes is that? Yeah. 33.17? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's start there. That's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I don't think there is a sound because she didn't want to hear my voice. So you have to listen to this. Uh, and I will explain it. We w were making a, a film with Danny Glover, and Ted John heard somehow that we will be in Mopti, a town in Mali called Mopti. And we go to Mopti, who do we see? It's Ted Jones. And then he and a famous uh, scholar of African-American uh, cinema called Ted Jones, I mean Ted Jones, uh, Clyde Taylor. So they are in the boat there. So Terry w basically wanted to locate Ted Jones in Africa. Uh, and uh, this is not Timbuktu, this is a town called Mopti, and they often call Mopti the Venus of Africa, something like La Venice de l'Afrique. Uh, and I, yeah, th this film, we did it. That's Laura in the back there. Yeah, the two of them are just having great time, and Terry doesn't want you to hear it. <laughs> so, so. Uh, no way. Oh, if she, let me say, see. Okay, then you can stop there, yeah. Yeah, we did the film for the great railway journeys that BBC commissioned all the time uh, for famous people going to Africa. And Danny Glover was going, and he said, I'm going to your, your country, so let's go. I said, yeah, let's go. So, and Clyde and Ted met us there somehow. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So, so the, the Terry's description, footage of him as he travels on the Niger River near Mopti, Andre Breton drifting of exquisite corpse, drifting of imagination possible. Cutting, again, he's going, uh, she's going back to do that word, uh, drifting and cutting. Cutting as a means of reshaping collage, uh, inserting and establishing new this and that, uh, throwing copies over the wall, writing in English, French, German, collapsing time through photocopying, layering and collaging. Jones allows his runaway scissors to snip snap and cut here and there from his story. So it's history, but it's last between his and then story. Uh, dismantling the world history, he speaks of a dual effort to confront the dominant narratives of colonial history, to cut at them, cut them off, and insert other features, future perspectives related to global black consciousness. Auto, so, autography and paste up postcard. So, uh, well, I'll read it. Maybe she's going to explain. I don't need. From the idea of auto, uh, autography, uh, no, autograph, comes Jones' auto, autograph. No, autography. Can't even say it. That's how bad this dude was. Uh, image from 1990s based on an August Sander photograph of German musicians. That's uh, what we have here. So Ted so Jones took that. August Sander photograph 1913, paste, uh, paste ahead, who is this? 
Walter Benjamin describes the photographs of Sanders as Sanders' work is more than a book of pictures. It is a book of exercise. Jones also creates autograph pa paste up postcard with Velasquez images of the Habsburgs. Returning to the exquisite corpse, John describes. Uh, so this is the original, uh, and this was this is what Ted Jones did with it. We we, we researched a lot. Of, uh, by the way, if anybody has an idea, the musician whose head is here, I thought it was called Tran, but it's not. If you know this musician, you can send it an email to. <laughs> to Terry because we did a little bit of research uh, I couldn't find it. It was Clyde who said, no, 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 that's not called Tran. I said, okay. Okay, you see the same ideas coming. So this is the word here, autograph, that I'm trying to pronounce and I'm, I'm having difficulties with. Uh, John described the artists who participate as the dream people. In, that's returning to the exquisite corpse, a means of drawing a line that drifts away from borders and oppression, perhaps even rejecting farewells. And Prague surrealist uh, Nezval wrote in mid-1930s, nothing is sadder than to part with mortals. Some thrilling mistake may put between us standing here embraced in friendship, a wall as thick as eternity. Some trifling mistake, some insignificant circumstance may bring it about that we never again form a magical constellation with our embracing eyes, end quote. Exquisite Corpse offers a continually renewed, renewed magical constellation at one point during a visit by Jones to Prague in the early 90s, he, it connected Czech artists to the African-American artist Jacob Lawrence. So this is something he's saying here. Oh, that was Jacob Lawrence there, yeah. Eya, so please forgive my pronoun, Eva, Svank Mazorova, okay. Uh, oh, you got it there. Okay. Uh, who writes on her drawing to a field as wide as green oak? Martin Steskal. Can't say the S, so you got to forgive me. Steskal. Uh, Ludwig Svab. Okay, so that, that's the end of it, basically. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't be a uh, chat GPT. That's, this is the biggest thing we have at our universities now because the, our professors are worried that uh, computers are going to be writing student papers for them and it's terrorizing universities <laughs> everywhere. So, but anyway, uh, we will try to answer questions, but please forgive me, I'm not a surrealist historian. I'm not even an art historian. I'm a literature person. Yeah, so there is, there is a question up there. A few over. remarks. Uh, few remarks, sir, first. Can you sit? Okay, I just gotta get my water. Okay, so we'll try to improvise something. Uh, I don't know, again, it will be big improvisation uh, for Mancha. Um, I wanted to ask briefly, I was looking at some um, interview by Ted Jones from 1997 with Henri-Louis Gates, and in which he speaks about especially his decision to move to Timbuktu and to live in Africa. And he says at that interview, which I found really interesting. I came to Africa 
not to live off Africa, but to live in Africa. I mean, not to live off in terms of like exploiting Africa, but to really be immersed in Africa, if I translate it. And he says something um, at that interview that uh, precisely in Africa, what's different for him is that um, he says, our artistic spirit is still alive, not dead like some Mona Lisa. So he really talks about his living in Africa as uh, something a living tradition, as embodying this living tradition. And so I was wondering if you have something that you might be able to add perhaps about this relationship of Ted Jones to Africa and to his experience, um, this idea that somehow in Timbuktu, the surrealism is a daily lived experience and not just something that should be in the museum. Uh, that, okay. So first, the, the interviewer, uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr., uh, known in the US as Skip Gates, uh, is uh, probably today the most famous uh, academic in black studies, basically. He, he now is at Harvard. Uh, and he too, like David Hammond, was in huge admiration of Ted Jones. He too went to Paris to find him. There is something really strange that attracts many African Americans who want to be cosmopolitan, uh, what I call homeboy cosmopolitan, that they attracted to Ted, Ted Jones in a way. So that that's quite important. So the, in the film clip that we showed, if we had the, the sound, Ted Jones is really addressing the African-American audiences. He say, you guys, you wear your dashikis, you pretend to be Africans, you come here. This is not how you come to Africa. Uh, and he, he's uh, living of Africa in, in one sense. It's not only European colonialism of Africa, but I think that's also taken by uh, black uh, capitalism of the US. That exploiting Africa, it's not so. And Ted Jones was very critical of that. You know, uh, he, that he was talking about that. And then uh, the the second point about your question, could you remind me? Yeah, he says that the artistic in Africa, the artistic. Yeah, yeah, is yeah, still yeah. Alive, yeah. Like yeah. 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 Uh, you know, at, I can only answer that by also uh, referring us to. Edward Gleason notion of the nomadic museum. The, new, the nomadic museum, which goes against the idea of the museum uh, where every museum is actually duplicating uh, the uh, first museums. And therefore, the Mona Lisa uh, is everywhere. Uh, it's a repetition, it's a repetition, and so on, uh, framing and everything. Whereas uh, Gleason, Ted John, they wanted a museum that's living museum, where people who have never been to a museum, they would go there and find something that relates to their life. They recognize themselves, but not this conventional museum. And Gleason has a beautiful essay on this uh, in Aesthetic de where he talks about beauty. What is beauty? So the, the first framing of the beauty is Mona Lisa. But that's a fixed notion of beauty. And so Glissa is saying, we should look for beauty instead in the process, in the process of making. Once the work is finished, he's no longer interested in it. So th that process is life, basically. Uh, so Ted Jones and Glissa both will meet there. I think what you say here, and that's really interesting also in relationship to uh, Ted Jones' practice of what he calls the jazz poems, uh, or the idea that somehow jazz would be the truly surreal music in itself, because it's the music that's precisely kind of drifting forwards and embracing anything that's aleatory and kind of uh, contingent. So in a way, in the way how we learn about his practice, there's no strict difference between life and poetry for him. So the life and poetry are almost close to indistinguishable in many ways. And in the same interview, which I'm using here, he says, for instance, this. He says, I'm a living poem, 
the French, or should I say the internationalist surrealists of the late 1920s used to write automatically. Well, I have gone beyond even that. I live automatically, and each day is a new page for me. So in a way, he calls his entire life a poem, and he talks about the idea also of a collective poem, like sort of contesting the traditional notion of authorship. So how would you define, maybe from what you know, this kind of relationship between um, you know, writing on poetry and life in Ted Jones' work? Well, you know, at, at, as you were reading, I was kind of, he, he came back to life to me, basically. I could, that's the Ted Jones. So uh, in 1985, I believe, after I defended my uh, dissertation, I was assistant professor at uh, UC Santa Barbara. And then I went to Shakespeare and Company and to look for Ted Jones. So that's his mailbox. I left a message, and he called me. And then, I, you know, we had an appointment at the Shakespeare and Company. He said, so you come back from Afri uh, America? I said, yes. And you have a PhD now. That's the way he pronounced it. You have a PhD? I said, yes. So OK, well, take me to a restaurant. So I took him. <laughs> so we walked to the first restaurant in Paris, Le, Cro Le Procop, Rue de l'Ancienne Comédie, crossing, uh, crossing uh, uh, at the uh, Boulevard Saint-Germain, at Odeon, you know, the intersection of Odeon. So there is a restaurant there. They claim that they are the first restaurant ever in Paris, Le Procop. So I'm doing free advertisement here. But, but uh, he took me there. Uh, he said, OK, now that you are a PhD, uh, let's go eat in this restaurant. So we ate, and then we went back to uh, Shakespeare and Company. He said, you see, I told him to go to America. He's now a PhD. He just took me to a restaurant. So this is, that's Ted Jones. Uh, he, what he's saying there is so, I keep seeing Ted Jones there. But what, what's interesting about jazz poem, uh, you know, it, it's hard to explain this. So I, I have better command of English than French, but my instinct is more French than English. So I have problems with translation sometimes. So uh, Glissant has this expression, which is uh, donner avec. Donner avec. You know, it's, it's, it's like let go. It's like go with it if you want. Uh, I don't know if some of you have a better translation of this expression, but it's being in a system like in the mangrove, because he's talking about the mangrove and the water is flowing. You go with the waves and then the waves get blocked by some other things, and then they get unleashed by other things, and it keeps going on like that. Jazz is exactly like that. And the, the, the way people enter in, the way they, they go out, other people enter in. And I mean, for uh, Amiri Baraka that I, I mentioned here, he said that jazz is the changing same. It's, it's, the, you know, it's the changing same. And then a uh, Gleason called jazz, uh, a repetition that is a retelling. And every time you retell, it's a detour. You're doing something else. So Ted Jones is in the canon both of surrealism there, but also of, uh, of uh, the, the, the jazz tradition. Uh, yeah. Even I can't keep it. Um, I was also curious, what do you know about Ted Jones' uh, political orientation? Because again, um, and I'm still using the same interview here, in the interview he says basically, uh, communism and capitalism are two outdated things, and I we think we have to get rid of these things that don't need to be. We've got to get into utopia. There's no reason for people to have to pay for heating their homes or public transportation or anything public. They should be free, but free without any sort of slave attachment. So somehow, in a way, he calls for utopia as something that should go even beyond a kind of a Cold War division between like communism and capitalism. So how would you describe his politics, basically? Yeah, uh First, I, I knew you would ask that question, but uh, 
Ted Jones, I agree with him in a sense that Edward Gleason also says that all ideologies will die. But he ended up, he ended with capitalism. His main enemy, he said, people don't think capitalism is an ideology. It's an ideology and it's going to die. That all ideology are, are coming to a, a dead end at some point. Because uh, capitalism cannot be sustained until we can handle distribution. And capitalism cannot handle distribution, you know, in many ways. So uh, it, then what is one's politics if one uh, want to be beyond uh, ideology? If I can, I'm co-opting your question and paraphrasing it in another way. You may not be saying totally that because we're going to fight later on. You know, <laughs> the, so, so, so she almost threw me in the charles <laughs> yesterday. That's all for my behavior. <laughs> so, so if we just look at the ideology, the charles, uh, not the charles, but uh, beyond ideology, how do we live our lives uh, in a way? Uh, this utopia. Uh, you know, at the end of my film again with Angela Davis, she said uh, that, I said, you are an optimist. She says, yes, and then she gave me that quotation, optimism is the something of the something. You know the quotation. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> but another way of what people say about optimism. But the, the point is that Gleason would say, I think I said this yesterday, let's have poetry be the source of knowledge. You know, art, you know artists like to say, many formally especially, that there is no uh, knowledge in a poem. But for Gleason, there, there is a knowledge that connects our intuitions. Uh, intuitions, uh, Gleason like to say, I don't know if I said this last night, but that if you have an intuition, you think that in this room is private, it only you know it, no one else knows it. But if we want to do something like uh, uh, Yana's question, then what do we do? Uh, Gleason say, if you would only dare voc uh, alter it, uh, uh, vocalize it, you will be surprised that the same intuition is being felt at the same time in Mali, in Japan, in Brazil, in other places. So we need to have a solidarity between our intuitions. Uh, and so this, this utopia is really <laughs> where we are, the solidarity of in, uh, intuition. How do we connect the world uh, that we want to see? But we all think that we are the only people with the secret. Uh, Gleason said, no, just if you are against something that's happening in the environment, just say it. You'll realize that there are many other people who are saying the same thing. Uh, if you run the back with it. Yeah, I think what you describe is this solidarity of sort of intuition. It's also linked to what I find interesting in Ted Jones, for instance, collages, is the way how he uses cartography as a very political gesture. Because, uh, for instance, if we think of his cartography collages of Berlin, I mean, the fact that he positions himself in Berlin as a kind of um, African um, a black artist, um, you know, we can also think of the role of uh, Bismarck and the Berlin Conference and the, the division of Africa. So, to what extent even this kind of idea that of erasing the borders or throwing poems across the borders is actually a reference to this history of Berlin in the, in the division of Africa. You know, this is, I mean, my main preoccupation now you know, is to, to try to make small films on this uh, a group of people that I, found, I, I think are the new or not. They are the philosophers of the new world. Uh, it, for people like Ted Jones, for people like Edouard Glissant, they are no longer at the moment of decolonization. Even though it, this gets me in trouble all the time because the most fashionable word now is decolonial. You know? So what, what the Glissants are saying is that the world has become connected. 
the world has become connected because of modernity, because of colonization, because of decolonization, and this world is no longer France uh, coming from Senegal. You know, if you want to call London, you have to call Paris, and then Paris make your telephone bounce in London. No, it, you know, now as a Soninke guy, my bro, uh, well, first, the long story, the short story is, I, I used to be a letter writer when I was growing up, because uh, I went to school, the other guys didn't go to school. And all the letters sounded exactly the same. Dear Yana, uh, the season, the, 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 the rainy season was not very good this year. Uh, some of the animals may have died. So and so had a baby. <laughs> we are all this. Allah is great. Can you send some money? So I, I would say writing the same letter to lots of people like that, you know, and I'm sure that my junior brother there did the same thing. You know, if you let, well, he's from the city. There is also a little difference. He's cosmopolitan Dakar. But, you know, I, I came from, from an ethnic group. They just don't go to school. So you write letters. So what happened is that... The, Today, when those same people, I'm not the, the exile, the emigre, when they write to me, they pick up the telephone, they push WhatsApp with the button, and they speak in Soninke to me. So the, this connected world is really where we need to work with and find its aesthetics. We don't know, you know, we're working with all the aesthetics, when we, the way we are today. And the world has become connected. How do we find the aesthetics of this connected, this one world? Gleason call it two mond. Now that we have become a two mond, one world in a relation, what are the new aesthetics? How can we get out of the binary oppositions, the uh, black, white, man, woman? How can we look? We may say all those things. I'm not saying we cannot say them. But what are the new aesthetics? This is the challenge that people like Ted John through surrealism are answering, uh, that people like uh, uh, Edward Gleason in, in poetics, philosophy of relation are trying to answer. Uh, it takes Fanon to a novel level. And this is not pleasant to some people sometimes, especially when, you know, I just want to talk about decolonial. And all my friends are in decolonial. So, so anyway. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Diavara, for this um, amazing improvisation, uh, replacing our good friend and comrade, Terry Guys. Uh, 